Okay, so we're going to talk about today the, the paradox of growing Web3 to Web2 scale. My name is Tal. I'm the co-founder of Orbs.com. Orbs is an L3 blockchain infrastructure provider running on top of EVM and TON. I'm also a mentor in the DeFi.org accelerator and a contributor to the open network, one of the most exciting L1 blockchains available today. And I live here in London. So what exactly is the new internet? What exactly is Web3? So let's compare Web3 to Web2, the internet as we know it today. Web2, the internet as we know it, is being run by corporations. Corporations are the major stakeholder in the network. And in Web3, we're seeing a shift toward users. We're making users a significant stakeholder in the network. Users are no longer just a product. Users are encouraged to participate in running the infrastructure. Users are encouraged to participate in governing the infrastructure and the apps running on top. Web2 is naturally centralized. What does centralization mean? Centralization means that the creator of a system is inherently not equal to the participants in that system. For example, let's take Google Search. Let's say that Google Search, they own the search platform, so it's okay for them to promote their own products artificially um, on the, uh, in the search results. Now, if I were to create a decentralized version of Google, uh, Google Search running on Web3, then the creator of the system is inherently equal to the participants. So I would not be able to promote my own product artificially on the search results. Web2 is permissioned. That means that in order to participate in Web2, I need to ask for permission from the people running the network. For example, if I'm using Gmail and I want to send a mail and Google regard my mail as spam, they can decide not to send it forward. In Web3, everything is permissionless. When somebody sends a transaction in Web3, nobody can stop that transaction. Permissionlessness means something else in Web3 as well, and that is who can participate in running the network. In Web3, anyone can participate, and this role is not limited only to a select few. Let's talk a little bit about custody and the ownership model of Web2. In Web2, users don't own anything by themselves. They use custodians to hold data for them. For example, let's say that I'm running my email system on Gmail, then Google is going to hold all of my emails for me. And if I breach their terms of agreement, they can decide to take my emails away from me. Now, this ownership model in Web3 is changed. And now, in Web3, I really own the data and even more, the assets that I hold. And you can see this with money. For example, in Web3, if I hold a token or an asset that is worth money, I'm holding it by myself and nobody can take it away from me. We can see that everything in Web2 is trust-driven. You can't really know anything, and you need to trust somebody that is operating the network for you. For example, we took Google as an example here. Then if I want to know if Google is manipulating search results, for example, I can ask them. They would tell me no, and I would have to take their word for it. In Web3, we have verifiability, meaning that any participant in the network can verify and make sure and prove that what anyone else is claiming is indeed true. Web2 is censorable, Web3 is not. Web2 uh, revolves around local payments. In Web3, I can pay anyone across border in the same smoothness that I can pay my babysitter right here in London. So Web2 is quite successful, the internet as we know it. It has 5 billion users. Now Web3 sounds great. It has so many benefits for users. But how many users are actually using it? And the number is quite disappointing only 20 million users. So maybe we're just in the beginning. Maybe this number is going to grow. So let's look a bit about growth of Web3. So this graph shows the Ethereum monthly active users since 2017. And we can see that this, this isn't a growth graph. It is growing, but very slowly, it's stagnating. So what is the sort of growth graph that we expect to see? Now, this is a growth graph. But unfortunately, it does not belong to Web3. It belongs to somebody else. This is a social network, Telegram, monthly active users since 2014. And you can see that so when something is growing, it is growing by 40% every year. Now, this is the, go the growth graph that we want to see for Web3, and we're not seeing it today. So this brings a very interesting question. Why, if Web3 is so great, why isn't nobody using it? So let's start with the answers that people have been giving. 
And the first answer was giving around 2018, and people said, don't worry, Web3 is coming, but the technology, the blockchain infrastructure is so complex and expensive that the infrastructure doesn't scale. Now, this answer is no longer true. We have blockchains today that can scale pretty much indefinitely. Um, so let's take one of these examples is the Ton blockchain I, men I mentioned before. And the Ton blockchain is inspired by Telegram's own architecture. Now, Telegram is processing today over 15 billion messages per day. Now, this is global internet scale. Now, we measure the ability to scale systems. One of the great tools to do that is using sharding. Now, first generation uh, blockchains like Ethereum had a single shard. Ethereum 2, 64 shards. The next generation blockchains like Ton have a practically infinite number of shards. Okay, every user account, every smart contract can effectively run on its own shard in parallel. And this architecture lets them scale pretty much indefinitely. Now, Ton has another very interesting property that it can dynamically split these shards when the load in the system is high, and it can automatically merge these shards together when the load is lower. Now, to write contracts for these new architectures is a bit more tricky. You can't just use Solidity. Solidity is not built for these things. So now we need to use new smart contract languages like Fancy that send messages in an asynchronous way. But there is a fruit for this because these new blockchains can support today millions of transactions per second. Okay? The scale is pretty much indefinite. And, and this is not a dream or something that we can see in a few years. The mainnet is available today. It's running in production since May 21. So the infrastructure is not what's holding Web3 back. It must be something else. So let's look for more answers. And the answer given in 2020 was this. For a project to really push Web3 to mass adoption, it requires an existing user base. It requires an existing uh, critical mass of users. A project like Ethereum that started with a zero user base does not have the critical mass to push it to mass adoption. So Ethereum will never be able to do it. So who will? So our eyes were set towards big players in the market that already have these users, that have the critical mass in existence today, and they could push their existing user base towards Web3. And we saw two big projects of this sort. One of them is Telegram. Telegram have a 700 million user base, and in 2018, they announced the Telegram Open Network. Uh, it's a blockchain with its Gram token. Um, but unfortunately, unfortunately, it couldn't find a regulatory path forward, and it had to seize in 2020. A different player was Facebook. Facebook have an even bigger user base, 3 billion, and they set their eyes on Web3 with Facebook DM. This is another blockchain project that they announced in 2019 with the Libra token. All of you have probably heard about it. But again, has to seize in 2022. So maybe these projects did not succeed, but there are others taking their uh, place. Uh, so again, I will use the example of Ton because this example is live today. So what happened is that in 2020, after Telegram pulled out of Ton, of the Telegram Open Network, the open source community took the code, it was open source, and took it over and created the open network uh, called Newton. Now, in May 2021, this has become an official mainnet, and Newton even received the ton.org website. In December 2021, uh, even uh, after Telegram pulled out of the project and is no longer involved in running it, the Telegram CEO recognized Newton as the true successor to the original Ton, and now Telegram is building things on top of Ton. I don't know if you saw in the news, I think from last week or two, Telegram are auctioning Telegram usernames on the Ton blockchain, which you can pay for Ton coins, okay? generating millions of dollars in revenue. So I think we can overcome these two hurdles, the hurdle of uh, the infrastructure not being able to carry Web3, and the hurdle of having a critical mass of users that will be introduced to Web3. Now, is this going to be enough? And the point of this talk, if you have one takeaway from this keynote, is that I don't believe that this will be enough. We still have a major obstacle that we need to come across. And this obstacle is that in its current form, regular users can't really benefit from Web3. Let's take a look at this from an example perspective. Okay? Now, we're all used to seeing smart contracts and automatically believing that anything running on, on, the, on the blockchain is automatically part of Web3. 
But this isn't the case. You have many projects running on blockchain that don't adhere to Web3 principles. And I want to show you an example. So let's take a look at USDC. USDC is one of the most popular stable coins. I'm pretty sure all of you are familiar with it. And USDC is a smart contract running on many blockchains. One of them is Ethereum mainnet. You can see the contract address there. Now, people would suppose it's a stable coin running as a smart contract, then it must be a Web3 project. But if you look closely, and let's look at all the criteria we've seen before that categorize Web3 and see if USDC meets these criteria. So first of all, is this user-centric? So no, um, USDC is run by a corporation called Circle. Is this decentralized? So if you look closely, you see that there are admin roles that are not equal. The creator of the system had to be equal to the participants, but we can see admin roles that, with privileges that only the creator can do, only Circle can do. One of these things that they can do is they can freeze assets and blacklist users. So it's not decentralized. Is it permissionless? And it appears that it's not. You need to ask permission to participate in USDC, because if they decide that you cannot participate, they can take their, your assets away from you. What is the ownership model of USDC? Do you own? So you may think that you own the token, and you see it in your wallet address, but your asset can be frozen by somebody else that is far away from you. So you don't really own anything. Um, verifiability, yes. Let's give them this much. OK, you can really see all the transactions on chain and verify. So I would say this is true. What about censorship? No. Um, you can censor USDC. And is it a good global payment system? I would say yes. You can really transact smoothly across borders, so this part is good. So you can see that even though it's running on blockchain, it doesn't adhere to the majority of the Web3 principles. So how would a user know something like that? So I'm going to give you an example from my own team. We have a, lot, a strong engineering team that we spent a lot of time teaching and training on blockchain and Web3. And this engineering team does due diligence for every protocol and every app before we participate in it. Okay, for example, on USDC. So what this due diligence process looks like. First of all, they would go to Etherscan and see if the source code of the contract is verified, meaning if the source code matches the bytecode on chain. Then they would ask themselves, they would dig in the source code and see, can anyone change the smart contract? Because if a smart contract can be changed, it's not really a contract. It would change tomorrow, and I don't know how it will be, happen. Who can upgrade this smart contract if, if it can be upgraded? Are there any time locks? Does it have a special admin role in the code? You have to look in the code. You will see the answer there. What can this admin role do? In USDC's case, this admin role can put you in a blacklist list. Is the supply of this token fixed? Who can mint more tokens? The person who can mint more tokens has a lot of power, and he will not be equal to the other users. So this violates the decentralization principle. Is there any big stakeholders? Are they vested? So these questions are complicated. But Web3 is built in a way that you can answer these questions by yourself. You don't need to ask anyone else. You go on chain, you read the code, and you know the answer. But is this feasible for users? So I'm going to show you a study created uh, by the OECD for ages 16 to 65 to measure tech literacy. And this is a study for 200,000 uh, people across the world. We can see that around 10% of them couldn't really even operate a computer well enough that they even felt uh, confident to participate in the study. Around 5% struggled with basic skills like scrolling. Around 15%, the most they could do is an action, simple action like deleting an email. Okay, the next group, 31%, they could maybe even search for a lost email. Okay, a bit more. Next group, level two, they could complete an unfamiliar checkout form in an e-commerce website. And the strongest group of all, only 5%, they could even answer a complicated question like, what percentage of emails John sent last month about Honduras? Now, we saw the complexity that Web3 requires you, for you to learn. How many of these users will be able to do this? And this presents us with a paradox, the Web3 scale paradox. The more people we approach, the more people we bring from the general population into Web3, the more dependent they are on trust. These people are not able to participate in the trustless system and verify and participate in the ownership model by themselves. 
this is inherently impossible, and I think that this is the, ma the next major thing that's going to block the growth of Web3, and us builders on this ecosystem need to resolve this. And this is exactly what we're doing today, and I want to talk a little bit about Orbs. So Orbs is a decentralized infrastructure uh, for protocols and dApps. It's running over EVM and TON, and it has dozens of validators from hun uh, with hundreds of millions of dollars staked. The mainnet is running since 2019, and it's operating in layer three. So one of the products we're building in the TON ecosystem, I don't know if you're renting a house here in London, but you've probably seen the energy ratings. Okay, your house comes with a very simple rating. A, your house is energy efficient. F, your house is very energy inefficient. Makes very easy for users to understand and participate. What we're building is a decentralized protocol for scoring trustlessness. You will see a protocol that, like USDC and see a letter from A to F. In USDC's case, the letter would be, for example, F. And you would see this protocol does not adhere to the Web3 principles. You would click on it, and it would tell you why. For example, it would say, the creator of this protocol can take your tokens away from you. Be aware. So this is a shift of education and making this. Now, uh, developing this product is not easy, because it has to be decentralized, or else we're dependent on trust. And the area users are going to meet this product is immediately before making a transaction. So imagine that you're using MetaMask, or imagine that you're using Toncoin Wallet, and you're about to approve a transaction that interacts with USDC. This would pop in, and you would see the trustlessness score. Thank you so much.